So we'll start our study of nomenclature with ionic compounds. First step is always identifying that it is an ionic compound. So how do you do that? Well, the biggest clue is the presence of a metal. If you have a metal and some nonmetals, one or more, it's probably an ionic compound. So if you see a metal, think ionic compound. And of course we divide ionic compounds into different categories. So an ionic compound is going to have a metal and a nonmetal, and we divide those into two different groups, one where the metal forms only one kind of ion, and one where the metal forms more than one kind of ion. We haven't talked about those ions yet. So type 1 ions um, always have the same charge. They form, they're type 1 because they form one ion. And those are the ones that we've talked about. So group 1A, group 2A, group 3A, and then there's two extra ones here, zinc and silver. So zinc is always plus 2 and silver is always plus 1. And let's see how we can um, see that from the periodic table. Actually, let's... Okay, so let's do a slightly different color here. So here's aluminum. And this is group 3A. So I've drawn just this little corner of the periodic table. We know that aluminum is plus 3 because it's in group 3A. And then we think about going down the stairs, like we're going down the stairs, one and two. So down one step from aluminum is zinc, and the charge is one less. And then going down one more step, the charge goes down one more, and is silver. That's not why they have those charges, that's how I remember what charges they have. So I find aluminum is in group 3A, so it's three plus, and then we go down the stairs plus 2, plus 1. So these type 1 metal ions are the ones in groups 1A, 2A, 3A, zinc and silver. So that's like a little chant. 1, 2, 3, zinc or silver. Those form one ion and those are called the type 1 ionic compounds. The type 2 ionic compounds have any other metal. So if it's not one of these that we've been talking about, then it forms more than one charge. Most of those are transition metals, but not all of them. So here is a table showing you um, metals whose charge is uh, invariant. They only form one ion. So sodium. Sodium always forms a plus one ion. It's in group 1A. Group 1, plus 1. Here's calcium. Plus 2 ion in group 2. Aluminum plus 3 in group 3. And then zinc and silver, you memorize, okay? Or you follow the pattern I showed you on the periodic table. So these type 1, did I skip something? Yes, I did. Okay, I thought it was something missing. So what about the other guys? Well, here are some of the other ones. So these all form more than one ion. So if we look at chromium, Chromium forms a three plus, I'm uh, sorry, a two plus and a three plus ion. Two different ions. And there's no predicting this from the periodic table. So what we do for their names, instead of just the element name, is we put the charge in Roman numerals after their name. So a chromium two plus ion is called chromium two ion. And chromium three ion is a CR three plus ion. We also have another system of naming over here. Um, it's called the stock system, and we're not going to learn it, but I just want to show it to you because you might see it. Um, it shows up in, in a couple of the labs occasionally, um, but I'm not going to test you on it. And this used um, suffixes of us and ick. The us was the lower charge and the ick was the higher charge, but it didn't tell you what the charge was. So you had chromus and chromic. And for chromium, that was plus 2 and plus 3, but if you got copper, you had plus 1 and plus 2. And tin was plus 2 and plus 4. And so it's a more difficult system to use, and so we're going to use the, um, 
the IUPAC system with the Roman numerals instead. So when we name the type 1 compounds, the names are, are pretty simple. We just have the name of the cation and then the name of the anion, and we change its ending. So I came up with a name for my chemistry world. I'm calling it Chemistry Land. It's like Disneyland, except it's probably not the happiest place on Earth, at least in students' minds. But it's, it's Chemistry Land, okay? And so that's where I have all my crazy pictures of what chemicals do. So in Chemistry Land, the metals are masculine and the nonmetals are feminine. And traditionally, when a man and a woman get married, who changes their name? The woman does. Okay, so here when we make an ionic compound, the man, the metal, his name stays the same. And the woman, the non-metal, changes her name a little bit. She changes the last part. So she changes the ending to ide. So if her name was chlorine, it becomes chloride. If it was oxygen, it becomes oxide. We don't need to indicate the charges on these metals because they're always the same. They're predictable from the periodic table. So examples. What's the name for NaCl? It's sodium chloride. So there's a process of thinking here. We look at the first element and we ask ourselves, is that a metal? Yes, it's a metal. So this is an ionic compound. That's what it tells us. Then we ask ourselves, it is, it, is it in group 1, 2, 3, zinc or silver? Yes. Yes, it is. It's in group 1A. That tells us that the charge is predictable, and so we don't need a Roman numeral or anything like that, and in the name of it is just sodium. And then we look at the other element. This is a nonmetal. In chemistry land, this is the woman, and her name is chlorine. So she's going to change her name when she hooks up with sodium and become chloride. And so we write the names next to each other, sodium and chloride. And just like human names have a space between the first name and the last names, chemical names also have a space between the first name and the last name. These are not proper names, though, so they're not capitalized. Any questions? Here's a table showing uh, some common anions and what their names become. So fluorine is the element. This is the ion. So the base part of the name is fluor, not flour. Flowers are made for, or flour is for cookies, and we don't have cookies in chemistry. So it's fluor, UO, and that anion name becomes fluoride. So chlorine becomes chloride, bromine becomes bromide, etc. These ones at the end, oxygen becomes oxide. And you might ask, well, where did that YG go? I don't know. It vanished into the ether. It just disappeared. Why? I don't know, because oxygide sounds funny. And what, what about nitrogen? There was an OG that went missing. Nitride or nitrogide? Nitride sounds better. Okay, so there are some little idiosyncrasies in the naming, just like we have in English in how we conjugate our, our verbs and such. I will not try to trick you on an exam, okay? So just uh, be aware of that. Little, little odd oddities here and there. Okay, how about let's practice naming these guys. So KBR, first we're going to look at the first element and ask ourselves, is it a metal? Yes, it is. Is it in group 1, 2, 3, zinc or silver? Yes, it is. It's in group 1A. So then for its name, all we have to do is write the name of the element, potassium. So that's the cation. In ionic compounds, there's always two ions. And we give the first ion its name and then the second ion. So the other ion is bromine. Bromine changes her name and becomes bromide. So this is potassium bromide. How about this one? Zn3N2. That well, looks kind of complicated. We don't need to do anything with the subscripts. We're just going to name the ions. So the first element is zinc. Is it a metal? Yes. 
Is it group 1, 2, 3, zinc, or silver? Oh, yeah, it's zinc. Okay, so it doesn't need a Roman numeral. We'll get to the rest of them soon. And then the other element is nitrogen. Nitrogen is feminine in chemistry land, and so we're going to change the ending of its name to nitride. So this is zinc nitride. Any questions? So I went to college at Iowa State University, and I remember, I could have my facts wrong, but when I, I remember them building a new building, and then there was this green lawn area nearby, and they didn't put any sidewalks. And people had to get from one place to another, so all the students, we just walked across the grass. And they didn't put sidewalks in for quite a long time. And as the students walked between the buildings where their classes were, they killed the grass, right? We called it a cow path. I don't know what people around here call it. You guys have lots of cows here in Tulare County, so maybe you call it that too. But if you have cows that are walking in the same place in the pasture, they form a path, right? A path formed by cows. It's a cow path. So the students at Iowa State are not cows, but we call them cow paths anyway. So there were the cow paths. And so after the cow paths got established, then the university came in and they put the sidewalks where the cow paths were. It's like, okay, here, this is where the students want to walk. We'll put the sidewalks here. And then there were no little trails that formed because they had already paved all the trails. Now what on earth does that have to do with chemistry, right? If you walk through the grass once, does it make a long-lasting path? No. You maybe you know, bend the grass down, but five, ten minutes later, you might have a hard time seeing where you walked. To make a path that's going to stay there, you have to go through and walk on that many times or get lots of people to walk on it. Eventually, the grass dies, the, the ground gets hard packed, and nothing grows there, and then the path lasts a really long time. That needs to happen in your brain. Okay, if you do problems like this, naming ionic compounds, and you do them once or twice, you're like, oh, okay. You've walked through the grass twice, and it's not going to last. You need to practice and do it over and over again until you wear cow paths in your brain. Okay, so that's what that has to do with chemistry. Practice. You have to practice in order to retain the information. And naming compounds is, is pretty important in chemistry. So this isn't one of those things where I'll tell you, eh, you could blow this off if you need to. Naming compounds and especially being able to put ions together in the right ratios is really important. So the other kind of ionic compounds. These are the, um, the metals that are not in group 1, 2, 3, zinc or silver. They need more than, they have more than one charge, and so we, we specify the charge using Roman numerals. So let's just review Roman numerals very briefly. So for one, the Romans used a capital I. For two, it was two capital I's. And for three, it was three capital I's. And as you can imagine, this could get pretty tedious if you just, you know, if 6 and 7 and 72 was 72 capitalized, what's the purpose of even having numbers? So they, they mixed it up a little bit. I'll put 5 over here. 5 was a capital V. I don't know why. And 4 is 1 less than 5. So it's I before V. It's 1 before 5. And 6 is 1 after 5, and so it's VI. And 7 is 2 after 5. And then it just keeps going on like that, and then it gets more and more complicated. And X is 10, and then there's M and C and L and D, and I can never remember those because I don't use them. But if you watch movies, a lot of times they'll give the, um, the year that the movie was made in Roman numerals. And you're like, all those weird letters down there. I have a hard time making them out myself. Because I don't use them very often. So these are the only ones I think we'll be using. But you need to know what the Roman numerals stand for. So when we're naming the other kind, the type 2, we have to specify the charge in Roman numerals. So for example, if you have a copper 
one plus ion. Copper is not in group one, two, three, zinc, or silver, and so its name is copper with the Roman numeral one in parentheses. There's no space between the end of the word and the parentheses. It's just tacked right on. And Cu2 plus is copper two, with the Roman numeral two. And the Roman numeral tells the charge. It does not tell the number of ions of, the, of that type. And that's a common mistake students make. So the pattern here is similar. We've got the name of the metal, but now we have the charge in Roman numerals, and then the base name of the anion, again with the ending switched. <coughs> um, a little twist with this is that we can't just um, pick the Roman numeral off the periodic table. We have to figure out what it is. So like if we look at FeCl3, well, that is an iron ion and three chloride ions. That's what the, f the formula tells us. And we know that chloride is minus one by its position on the periodic table. So what we need to know is what's the charge on the iron ion. And we figure that out by looking at the anions. So if we add all these up, I didn't leave enough room, this is a total of negative three. It has to be neutral, so if there's minus three, then over here we have to have plus three. There's only one of these from the formula. And so this plus three charge is divided among all the iron ions in this formula, but there's only one. So this must be three plus. So when we, when we go to write the name for this guy, we look at FeCl3, Fe is a, is a metal, this is ionic, we find out iron is not in group 1, 2, 3, zinc, or silver, so when we write the name, we write iron, and we say this is going to need a Roman numeral, so we write the parentheses and leave some space, and then the chlorine, its name gets changed to chloride. Then we do this business here, either actually on paper or in your head, to figure out what the charge is. We figured out the charge is 3, and so we put the Roman numeral 3 in parentheses. And the name of this is iron 3 chloride. Any questions? So I kind of did this ahead. And I did it this morning too. So the name for FeCl3, Fe is iron. Because it's not in group 1, 2, 3, zinc, or silver, we need a Roman numeral to tell the charge. Because otherwise, we're not going to know what the charge is. And the idea here is that if I give someone the name iron 3 chloride, they are going to know what formula it has. Or if someone gives you the formula, you can give the name. There's only one formula and one name for each compound. If I just write iron chloride without the Roman numeral, then the person reading it doesn't know which iron ion I meant. Because there's more than one. There's plus two and plus three. It could be either one. And so we have to tell the charge, and we do that using Roman numerals. So name the compound PBO. So we look at the first element. Is it a metal? Yes. How do we tell it's a metal? Well, we find it on the periodic table, and it's over in the main group there, but it's to the left of the stair-step line. On these periodic tables, it's red. It starts at boron and goes down like stairs to astatine, AT. To the left of that are metals. To the right are nonmetals. If there's a metal, it's ionic. So Lead is a metal, and then we ask ourselves, does it need a Roman numeral? I've got a no. The question we're asking is, is it in group 1, 2, 3, zinc, or silver? No, it isn't. So lead is a little tricky because it's not a transition metal. Most of the type 2 metal ions are transition metals, but not all of them. 
Tin and lead and bismuth are three that are not transition metals, but they do form more than one ion. So we know by looking at the periodic table that we need a Roman numeral and that this is lead, lead, and we're going to leave a space for the Roman numeral. Oxygen, so in chemistry land, oxygen's the woman, and she's getting married to lead, and so she's going to change her name and become oxide. Now we're going to figure out the charge by looking at the charge. We'll figure out the charge on the lead by looking at the charge on the oxygen. Here we've got one of each. We've got one lead ion, and we will have one oxide ion. From the periodic table, we tell that oxygen has a 2 minus charge. If there's one of each, then the lead must be what? Plus 2. So the lead is going to be plus 2. So this is lead 2 oxide. We could also have a lead 4 oxide, and its formula would be different because it's a different compound. Okay, let's do this one. Cu2S. Cu is copper. Is that a metal? Yes. Is it in group 1, 2, 3, zinc, or silver? No. It needs a Roman numeral. So this name starts copper. There's going to be a Roman numeral. S is for sulfur, which becomes sulfide. So we've got copper something sulfide. So we look at our, our formula now. We've got two copper ions, and we've got one sulfur ion. What's the charge on a sulfur ion? Two minus. So total over here, we've got negative two. That means that we must have plus two over here. And it's divided between these two copper ions and it has to be divided equally. Another way to think about this, sulfur is a mom, and she's bringing two cookies, okay? And these are the little boys, and the cookies that the mothers bring are going to be divided among the little boys. Sometimes there's one mom, sometimes there's three moms, sometimes there's six cookies, sometimes there's one cookie. In this situation, we have two cookies, and we have two little boys. How many cookies can they each have? One. That's easy, right? See, your brain can do the math. The math isn't hard. But sometimes, because you're thinking about ions and charges and balancing and all this weird stuff that we're talking about, your brain freaks out. So just tell it to think about little boys and cookies. Okay, so these are each plus one. Each boy gets one cookie. And so this is copper one sulfide. Any questions? So we've been talking about binary um, ionic compounds where we've got a metal and a nonmetal, but we can also have ionic compounds where we have more than one nonmetal. And we talked about these a little, we talked about parentheses around these guys. So polyatomic ions are these uh, bundle packs. So poly meaning many, atom meaning atom, many atoms. The names of the polyatomic ions have to be memorized. They're not readily discernible from the periodic table. There are hints there, but nothing, nothing just spelled out for you. Several of these were on the list of memorization stuff that I gave you at the beginning of the semester. Things like carbonate and acetate and nitrate and hydroxide and those sorts of things. So here's a table from your textbook showing um, the most common polyatomic ions. What's the most common element that you see? Oxygen. A lot of these have oxygen in them. Many of the polyatomic ions have oxygen in them. And, and some of their names just don't make a lot of sense, like acetate is C2H3O2 minus. Doesn't, there's nothing there. Carbonate, though, this is carbon and oxygen. So carbonate, carbon from the element named carbon. 
Pure hydrogen carbonate is carbonate ion with a hydrogen ion stuck on it. Um, nitrate is from nitrogen. Sulfate is sulfur and oxygen. So it's not completely random, but it's fairly random. And there's a special guy down here. All of these are negative except, oh, yeah, writing in white, that's not a great idea. Let's try red. This guy down here, ammonium. He's the only positive polyatomic ion. So naming these guys, we call these the ones with oxygen, we call them oxy anions because they've got oxygen in them and they're anions, oxy anions. <coughs> and there are um, some series of oxygen, of, I'm sorry, of oxy anions. So if we look at nitrate and nitrite, what's the difference? NO3 minus NO2 minus. The only difference between these is the number of oxygens. You see that? They both have one nitrogen. This one has three oxygens. That one has two. That's a little different. The charges are the same. Charges are the same. The nitrogens are the same. Only the oxygen is changing. And their names are related. This is nitrate. This is nitrite. Nitrite is the light version of nitrate. Like Bud Light has a third fewer calories than regular Bud, right? So nitrite has a third fewer oxygens than regular nitrate. And that pattern works over here for sulfate. Here's sulfate, SO4, 2 minus. Sulfite is the light version. It's got one less oxygen. So when you change that ending from ate to ite, you've just got one less oxygen. The charge stays the same. So I think I made you memorize nitrate and sulfate and phosphate. And then you can do nitrite, sulfite, and phosphite. All you do is take off one oxygen. So you memorize some, and then the rest you figure out through a pattern. And then we have the halogen sisters. Okay, the halogens are nonmetals, and in chemistry land, the nonmetals are women, and so these these are sisters. Chlorine, bromine, iodine are all in the same family, right? Girls in the same family are sisters. They have some things in common. So let's first look at chlorine and what chlorine does. So here we have chlorate. Chlorite is the light version. Just, we just talked about that. So that's one less oxygen. And then we have hypochlorite. So here we have a prefix in front of that. So hypodermic needle. Where does a hypodermic needle go? Under your skin, right? Your, your skin is your dermis. So hypodermic means under the skin. Hypo is a prefix that means less. So hypochlorite is even one less oxygen than chloride. So you memorize chlorate. Chlorite is one less. And hypochlorite is even one more less. And then we have, going in the other direction, we have perchlorate. Hyperactive. A hyperactive child has extra energy. They are extra active. Per means more. <coughs> so hypo is less and per is more. So chlorate has three oxygens and perchlorate has four. And then we have exact same patterns for bromine and iodine. Iodate is IO3 minus. Bromate is BrO3 minus. Chlorate is ClO3 minus. So if you memorize the formula for chlorate, and then you remember that the ite is one less, the hypo blank ite is two less, and adding more would be per, so chlorate becomes perchlorate, and then bromine and iodine do exactly the same thing. So you, you remember a pattern with prefixes and suffixes, you memorize one ion and its name, and you can write all the ions in this chart. I think that's better than trying to just flat out memorize them all. Now there's a note here. Mastering chemistry wants you to put the word ion. So if it gives you something like, you know, like this and says, what's the name of this? 
and you have to type it in. It wants per bromate ion, and it's going to care about that. So that's just a heads up on that. Um, some of these polyatomic ions are in substances that you might have around your house. Sodium hypochlorite. Hypochlorite is ClO minus. Sodium hypochlorite is in household bleach. It um, removes color from many things and it kills bacteria. Sodium bicarbonate. That's what baking soda is. Bicarbonate is another word for hydrogen carbonate. Just like um, people, most people go by two names, a first name and a last name, but some people go by a first, middle, and last name. There are a few compounds that have three names, and sodium bicarbonate or sodium hydrogen carbonate is one example. Bicarbonate is kind of a longer, I'm sorry, an older name, and... Uh, I'm going to fit. Yeah, good enough. Sodium, I think sodium hydrogen carbonate is, is better because it tells you there's a hydrogen in there. And the, the prefix bi suggests um, two, right? Um, but it, that's not what it means at all here. So we've got sodium bicarbonate and baking soda. Um, calcium carbonate um, is useful as an antacid. And sodium nitrite is a preservative in um, packaged meats. Okay, and so sodium nitrites are not particularly good for you, but uh, bacteria-laden lunch meat isn't really good for you either. Botulism is not a good thing to mess around with. So here's an example, two examples. Name the compound MnNO22. So the first thing we do is we look at the first element. Is it a metal? Yes. Is it in group 1, 2, 3, zinc or silver? No. So that tells us it needs a Roman numeral. So MN stands for manganese. Manganese. It needs a Roman numeral, so I'm going to remind myself of that by putting the parentheses in. Don't get it confused with magnesium, and don't, uh, don't use the fanciful manganesium. Okay, there's, there's no manganesium. It's made up by creative students. Two ions. Two. See, they're two fingers. Two ions. Students sometimes get creative and they try to tell me, well, this is, this is manganese nitrogen oxide. And name every single element. No, this is an ionic compound. It has two ions. So we've got the manganese and we've got everything else. Everything else is one ion, and it has a particular name. Now, the parentheses and this two out here are just telling us how many of that polyatomic ion we have. The actual ion formula is NO2. And the charge on that is minus 1. Now, how are you supposed to know that? Well, what's NO3? NO3 is one you're supposed to memorize. It has a charge of minus 1. This is just the light version of NO3. NO3 minus was nitrate. This is nitrite. So this has the name nitrite. And just like we did with the binary type 2 ionic compounds, we have to figure out the charge on the manganese by looking at the charge on the anion. So this formula tells us we've got two of these guys, and we have one manganese. So over here, we have two moms, and they're each bringing one cookie. We've got a total of two cookies over here. And then over here, there's only one little boy. Well, he's lucky. He gets both of the cookies. So he gets a plus two. So we have a total of plus two and minus two. It adds up to zero. The charges always add up to zero. So it ends up being, let's well, just, this just occurred to me. Well, actually, let's use um, the charge on the cation plus the charge on the anion equals zero. 
So if you want no one, you can figure out the other. So if the charge is 2 plus, then the name is manganese 2 nitrate. Does that make sense? Again, you're walking through the grass once or twice here, and you're going to have to go home and do this over and over again until you make a path that you can see. Let's name this next one. That looks like Coco 3, doesn't it? But one, one O is a lowercase O, and one is an uppercase O. And so there's a difference here. First, first element. Let's, let's break that in half. First element, CO. Is it a metal? It's cobalt. It's a metal. It's on the metallic side of the periodic table. Okay, so cobalt. And then we ask ourselves, is that in group 1, 2, 3, zinc, or silver? No, it isn't. It needs a Roman numeral. Great. So we'll figure out what that Roman numeral is later. So cobalt was one ion. Everything else is the other. What's the name of CO3? Carbonate. Now we talked about series of ions, and so you could imagine carbonate and percarbonate and carbonite and hypocarbonite. Turns out those don't exist. But if they did, we would follow the naming pattern. And it's not your job to know which ones exist. So if you never see carbonite, that's, that's why. So it doesn't actually exist. So we've got these two ions. We've got one of each. We've got the cobalt and we've got the carbonate. We need the charge on the carbonate is 2 minus. There's one of each, so the charge on the cobalt is 2. So this is cobalt 2 carbonate. Yes? Because I have it memorized. How are we You're supposed to memorize carbonate. That was on the list. The Pardon me? It was on the memorization list. Yeah. Was it? No. No? Hmm. Well, the good news is I'm going to give you a 3x5 card. So you can write that on your 3x5 card. Or you can photocopy the, or take a picture and print it and shrink it down however you want. And so if, if you're proactive enough to put those on your card, I will let you use them. So practically speaking, how do you know that? You look it up. Okay. But it's going to save you a lot of time if you at least have the more common ones memorized. Any other questions? This is not for this exam on Thursday. This is for the next exam. Everything we're talking about today is on the next exam. Any other questions?